Hello guys, welcome to the channel. My name is Excoundrel and I'm a TFT content creator. Today we're going to be focusing on some of the core lessons that I have learned to push myself into master tier. This is my graph. You can see that I've been up and in and out of master tier a lot over the last two weeks or so. Um, and this is a very common story. I've been in master tier five separate times and then dropped out just due to lack of being or lack of understanding about what I need to do to get better. Uh, I then recently, and it feels like every TFT player seems to have had the same epiphany as me at the same time, because just today I saw on the front page of the competitive TFT Reddit a post about this, which is essentially the similar kind of story that I'm going to be telling in this video, which is playing your strongest board. Um, this is a very, very important lesson that I've learned, and it's allowed me to place more consistently in my games. Yesterday, I went into games with the mindset of playing my strongest board, and I got four second places and a fourth so i got top four every single game didn't get a win in any any of them but i got second places which is a good enough you know place to get a consistent lp game so what we're going to be focusing on this video is the lessons that i have learned to achieve this consistency um this video and my channel is sponsored by g2a by the way so there's a ref link in the description below if you want to click it cool let's get into the meat of the video then and we're going to be focusing on three separate areas we are going to be looking at in this video, we're going to focus on our early game and our mid game. A uh, late game will come in a later video. So when we talk about early game, we're going to be looking at items and comps that work well. Uh, and these are just my opinions. Um, please go and research as many good players as physically possible. That's how I learnt. Uh, and make your own conclusions. So I'm only giving you some small examples of, of early game. You should go and do your own research too, because that will really help you improve as a player. Mid game, we're going to be talking about strongest board, which is one of the biggest things that people struggle with. It's about transitioning. And a lot of people struggle with transitioning because they end up playing a weak board and lose too much HP in the mid game. So let's start off with the early game. And when I'm talking about early game, what I mean is from the start of the game to the Krugs or the Terror Busters, as they're known now in the galaxies. Here are some examples of good early game boards. These are not the only good early game boards that you can play, um, but they are some examples of early game boards. And they all follow the, the thematic of frontline and damage. Three Cybers, Fiora, Lucian, and Leona. Really good and can transition very nicely into Cybers, Vanguards, Blasters at level 5 with Jace and Graves as an addition. That gives you Space Pirates as well. In my opinion, one of the strongest early boards that you can physically have in the game, especially with the right items. Brawlers with a front line with Chrono of Caitlyn. I think Twisted Fate works well, but two-star Caitlyn I think is better because her ability is going to guarantee yourself a kill on at least one person unless they've got Dragon's Claw most of the time. And you can transition that into Celestial Snipers with Ash and Cassadin if you're lucky enough to find them. Cassadin is a massively underrated unit, by the way. Or you can go into four Chrono with Shen and Twisted Fate, which sets you up nicely to move into something like Kale if you wanted to. Or you can continue down the, the, the Brawler's path and go down into Brawler Blasters. Then you have things like uh, Brawlers and Blasters from the, the get-go, so using Graves and then getting that into a red buff on a Lucian or an Ezreal. Um, again, I think you need red buff to really snowball with Brawler Blasters. I think you need to have some kind of on-hit effect, and red buff is probably the best one in the early game, so you probably won't be able to win streak too hard if you don't have red buff with the Brawler Blaster start. Or you can play Vanguard Frontline and then Vanguard Frontline with practically anything, just any kind of damage dealers, Sorcerers. Um, I like Caitlyn and Chrono. There's loads of things that you can play. Vanguards, two Vanguards right now are just super strong, and I think um, you can do a lot with them. So here is the tier list of early game units. Um, I think a lot of the time I have underrated some units. So for instance, Kha'Zix is maybe a little bit underrated here because he can be good, but I think a lot of people know how to shut down Kha'Zix's positioning now, which I'll talk about in a moment. So he maybe doesn't come off as strong as he should. S tier units. These are units that I think individually can have impact, um, regardless of who you put them on the board with, who you work with them. I just think these units are the ones that are most likely to have impact um, by themselves. So things like Blitzcrank, incredible individual unit. Caitlyn can usually take out one person by herself. Darius, especially two star, can start dunking on people. And when it comes to the one costs, guys, the one costs on this list, I'm talking about them as if they were two star. Um, one cost one stars are generally pretty bad all the time. So I'm talking about these these one stars as sorry, these one costs as if they were two star. Jace, really easy to make a Vanguard bonus with him, and I think he's incredibly good. And I, like I said, I think Cassadin is one of the most underrated units. I think Cassadin is very strong. 
The A tier units are units that I think can do really well when paired up with the right combination. So you're going to see a lot of the vanguards in here. You're going to see a few of the brawlers in here, especially think people like Vi. You're going to see people like Zig, so I think it's good by himself, but shines when he's with a rebel. Um, you're going to see Ash, who I think is a really solid unit by herself, but does really well when combined with Caitlyn or with another Celestial. Lucian, who you might think, wow, why is Lucian down there? But I think Lucian as an ind individual unit is not as good unless he's paired up with brawlers or he's paired up with cybernetics and there is Zaya there as well Zaya is really good in a blade master start um or she's just really good with items so that's why i've not put her in s tier because i think Zaya without items is a bit mediocre but you give Zaya a last whisper or a static shiv in the early game she's going to carry you going down to b c and d tier b tier are like good units like i think master Yi is underrated but i don't think he's insane um and again he's in there because rebels are a strong start uh, and then going down towards D tier. D tier units are the units that I would never play most of the time. Jarvan at two star is okay, but like I just don't think he's fantastic. I'd usually hold him on my bench if I'm playing Shredder, for instance. So here's just like a general list of what I feel is strong. Uh, and you can kind of concoct your own compositions based on what you know you feel is strong and based on this list if you really want to as well. When it comes to items, I've done the same thing here. So I'm looking at items, and we are looking at adaptability over raw power. One of the biggest mistakes that I was making over the last few weeks was I would slam something like a giant slayer in the early game and be like, me brawler blaster. And then I would just never get the units that I needed and I'd come sixth or seventh. And I'd be like, but I got a two star jinx with giant slayer and, and I had a giant slayer in the early game. What's going on? Uh, giant slayer is, is really only good in brawler blaster. If you slam the item, you've wasted a bow and you've wasted a BF sword that could have been adaptable and used in other items. So some of the items that I think are really good in the early game to put down are things like GA. I think GA is universally adaptable. It can be used in lots of compositions. I think Morello's is very adaptable. Maybe not as adaptable as some of the other items that I put in S tier, but I do think Morello's is a really, really good item. Uh, Ionic Spark, adaptable, can be used in loads of different um, in loads of different uh, compositions, and I think is an incredible item. Quicksilver is universally useful uh, and is very good in the early game, especially if you're going up against a lot of CC. And I put Redemption up there. Why have I put Redemption up there? Um, I think Redemption is a hugely underrated item. I genuinely do, and I use it in a lot of my compositions now. I don't always slam it early game, but if I get something like if all I've got is a tier and a um, and a giant spell, I'm probably just going to play Redemption, because it, I think it's one of those items, if placed on the correct unit, it, it acts like a full Soraka heal in the early game a lot of the time. It's, it's really good. Um, then looking at the A tier items, you've got things like Frozen Heart, uh, Bramble Vest, Gwinsu's. Zephyr is good, but I think, again, it's one of those items that um, I prefer to have mid game or late game rather than just straight up play in the early game. Because especially, especially because I think that um, Negatron Cloak can go to something like Quicksilver, which I think is a bit a bit more useful. Trap Claw is like a, just a worse version of, of of Quicksilver in the early game, in my opinion. Good late game, don't get me wrong, but a little bit worse in the early game. Last Whisper is good, and I think is adaptable across a lot of compositions like Cybernetics, Zaya, and Brawler Blaster. Um, but it is one of those things that I would only slam if I had like a two star Zaya, for instance, or I was pretty confident that I could transition into one of those comps. Red buff, I've put it down there because I only think I think red buff is only good if you've got a, a a blaster start. I don't think red buff is good outside of a blaster start. Personally, I think to the reason I put Morellonomicon above red buff, even though they're basically the same thing, is that Morellonomicon can go on lots of units that have got AOE abilities. Red buff, if you're giving it to something like a Caitlyn, not going to have the same kind of impact. A ZZ Rock Portal is actually really strong. Um, and I've seen a lot of high-level players use Z-Rock Portal to try and snowball. So I think Z-Rock Portal is a good item, and it's for me. I don't usually slam it if I if I if I don't need to, but it's an item that I will play if I don't have anything else to play, basically. And Infinity Edge is pretty universally adaptable as well, so I like to put that up there. I'm not going to go through all of the items, but the items down in D tier, the reason they're in D tier, apart from Ludens, which is generally a pretty crap item, is that they generally pigeonhole you into compositions, and you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into a composition in the early game, because that is what's going to lead to errors in the mid game, because you're going to try and force something, and it's not always possible to force something in TFT. So, I mean, obviously people can play Mech Infiltrator, and they can force it, and that works, but I think to be a really good player, you have to have the ability to, to sort of read the room and, and see what you go based on the, the, the units that you're given. And things like Hextech Gunblade is just bad, Bloodthirster is kind of bad, but things like Runins, it's good only good for Jin most of the time. Things like Rapid Fire Cannon, yes, okay, it can be used on Jinx, but it's suboptimal. It's really only good for Kale. Uh, Swordbreaker, I think it's only good in Brawler Blaster again, and even then it's as a last resort. So that, that's just my, my thoughts on items in the early game. Um, let's have a quick look at early game position. Okay, guys, let's talk about early game positioning. And this is a style of positioning that I learned by watching high elo streams and figuring out why exactly this was the case. 
Um, I wondered why I would see people like Dasic and Raikou Mastery put like their their entire composition on the back line, you know, in, in a lot of circumstances. And I kind of figured it out as I went along because it's what we call like a hold all positioning or a catch all positioning rather. This this positioning is designed to deal with a lot of the really annoying early game threats. And in general, it doesn't perform any worse than setting up your positioning normally. This deals or attempts to deal with Blitzcrank and Kha'Zix at the same time. Okay, so I want to focus on why that is. First of all, why have I got Shen here? And why have I got Graves here? Well, that's a pretty simple reasoning, okay? What happens is you usually put... You usually put a melee unit or a unit that you don't mind getting pulled by Blitzcrank on the outside of your backline row. This is important because, uh, essentially, if you end up seeing a Blitzcrank here or here, this Blitzcrank is going to pull your Shen, which you don't mind, and this Blitzcrank is going to pull... Uh, whatever unit that you have on this side. In my in my case, this is the Graves, and I don't mind Graves getting pulled either, especially at two star, because A, he's melee, and he's just going to get into melee range a bit more quickly, and he's going to cast his ability very quickly as well. I have my Malphite here, just because uh, I'd prefer my Graves to get pulled rather than my Malphite 1, um, and then my Malphite 1 can join the fight and tank anybody that moves forward like this. So my, my, Malph my Malphite is tanking for my, my Lucian and my Caitlyn, for anybody that is in the center. And then my, my Shen is getting pulled by a Blitzcrank that could be on this side. My, my uh, Graves is getting pulled by a Blitzcrank that could be on this side. Okay, so I hope that, makes, hope that makes sense on that front. Why have I got Lucian and Caitlyn in the middle here like this? Well, that's because the other annoying early game threat is a Kha'Zix. So let's say, and, and, and I've got to be honest with you guys, Lucian is not the best unit to have as your secondary ranged here. Usually you want two ranged, and ideally those ranged aren't going to move. The problem with Lucian is he moves, and so that means he isolates Kate, uh, Caitlyn. But the other early game threat that we, we don't like dealing with is Kha'Zix. Um, Kha'Zix will jump to the back line. If you have an isolated back line carry, he's usually going to one-shot them at some point in the fight. So we have our two ranged, um, and again, like I said, ideally that ranged would not be Lucian, because Lucian moves and he will isolate my Caitlyn. But if we have two ranged that aren't going to move, um, in a lot of circumstances they will stay there together, and it means that Kha'Zix will not get the isolated damage bonus um, on either of my ranged carries, which means they're going to survive the other really annoying early game threat. The other traditional type of position positioning that we see in the early game is we have two frontline carries here, we have your main carry here, and then you have whoever you want to get Blitzcrank hooked here. The problem with that is it, it relies on the enemy Blitzcrank being on this side. Because um, sometimes the enemy Blitzcrank being on this side will throw your plans off, he'll pull one of your front line away, and then your, your carry gets exposed, okay? So that was the traditional positioning that we used to see. Um, the only other issue with that is that this this whoever this would would usually move up over here somewhere, and then your carry here, your Kaz the enemy Kazix would just jump in and kill them. Uh, and that that didn't protect him against Kha'Zix. And even though it was good, it was it wasn't quite as um, easy to deal with a lot of the early game threats as you, you saw previously. So what we're going to do is now I'm going to play this fight forward, and I'm going to see how that positioning impacted my board. Okay, so let's take a look at this round, just based off uh, the same board state that you saw previously. And actually, I managed to get the perfect board to show you what I mean. My Shen gets pulled, he immediately casts his ability, and that keeps him safe for a bit longer, distracting the front line. Yes, my Lucian gets isolated, but he actually drags the Kha'Zixes away, and then they get stuck on the Graves, who was on the right-hand side of my positioning. They don't get the kill, and a guy with two one-star Kha'Zixes, um, as well as a pretty strong board overall, couldn't actually find the win, just due to positioning on my front, which was a really, really good way of dealing with that early game board. Um, and it's allowed me to continue my win streak all the way up to Krugs. So I'm in a great position, you know, both economically and uh, in, in, in the game state. So that's, you know, what I wanted to focus on in terms of early game positioning. So let's talk about early game leveling before we move on to mid game. I know I said I was moving on to mid game soon, but there's so much to talk about in the early game that I, I wanted to, to do this bit as well. Early game leveling is something that confuses a lot of people, but in my eyes, there are three main ways to look at it. Either you're going to be playing for a hyper roll, so you don't level at all, and that's really easy. So if you're playing for a hyper roll composition, let's say you find a load of Zayas early on, you find a load of Jarvans, Caitlins, uh, you know that you're going to be playing for a Shredder comp, or you're aiming to play for Shredder or for Candyland. Um, you don't level at all. That's the really easy thing to look about. Take this example right here and ignore my massive misclick because I meant to put the Yasuo in front of the Sona. But 
let's talk about this this the reason i leveled up on 2-1 here the reason i leveled up on 2-1 is because i had a two star ziggs i had a two star fiora and i could add a three rebel bonus in and although the items don't make sense in the ziggs um and you know although I've, I've randomly assigned items to my yasuo i knew that three rebels plus a two star fiora would be a strong board state to go into this game with and that's why i chose to level up on round 2-1 in general, if you're looking to level before the first carousel, there needs to be a reason that you're going to do so. And it's about assessing how strong your board is going to become, and that is usually because you're going to activate another synergy of some sort. For instance, you've got two vanguards and a Kha'Zix, and you find a Kaiser. You want to go for the two infiltrator bonus early on. You've got two brawlers. You want to activate the next chrono bonus. Usually, you're going to make that decision to level up before the carousel round to four, like without waiting for it to happen naturally at 2-3, because you want to have... Um, some kind of ability to win streak and that is going to be off the back of just having some good early game synergies to work with so that's the first piece of advice when it comes to leveling in the early game don't level unless you have a reason to the next piece of leveling advice is going to come from um, something called pre-leveling which happens at round two three now i in a lot of games end up pre-leveling unless i'm looking to go for a hyper roll composition so pre-leveling is something that i do um, and you, I learned it from a guy called Pulp, but it is something that has become quite popular in high elo in general over the last couple of days, is putting two rounds of experience in before the first carousel round to hit level five once you exit the carousel round to increase your chances of finding a forecast. And that forecast can sometimes often be comp defining or game defining. Let's take this game for a specific example, I'm going to show you my pre-level at round 2-3, and then we are going to fast forward past the carousel round to show you what happened. Okay, so here is me putting that extra experience in to go 8 out of 10 level 4 before the carousel. Now we've hit the carousel, and we're going to skip through this to show you what happens once I head back from the carousel at round 2-5. Uh, Boom, a jinx in my shop. Instant buy. Instant buy on the jinx in my shop. Um... Because that now gives me a really important rebel um, and also allows me to think about where I'm going to transition my composition into. Uh, and you can see here that we're just in a, we're just in a super good spot um, because of uh, because of that pre-level. And you can see people pinging me. But that, that's because I made that pre-level. I made that choice to pre-level. Uh, and that would be the, the three leveling strategies that I look at in the early game, okay? Uh, if you don't choose to pre-level, and you want to save your economy, so there is another way to play this. You, you save 10 gold before the carousel round, you don't want to pre-level. Uh, if you're not looking to go for a hyper roll, I would recommend leveling to level 5 after the carousel round. Um, this protects one gold economy that you get from the 10 gold that you got previously, and it should help you have a slightly healthier economy going to the Krug round, but it will give you one less shop to potentially find an important forecast, which is sometimes worth the investment early on. So that's what I would say when it comes to uh, leveling strategies. You've got don't level at all for hyper roll. You've got level up before the carousel round to hit four early if you feel like your composition is going to get stronger because of it. You've got pre-leveling, which I just did in this clip here, which shows that you can find a, um, a potentially very important uh, forecast unit. And then you have, obviously, leveling up after the carousel round to slightly protect your economy. But you do need to be level five, I think, after the carousel round, unless you are trying to go for that hyper roll. So that concludes our early game. Wow, that took a long time. Uh, hopefully the mid game won't take as long. Okay, let's talk about the mid game, which is from stage three to stage five. We're talking about all the way through stage three and all the way to stage four. That is what I consider the mid game. You should be building your strongest board at any given time and you should be planning around your items. Let's take this example. I'm going to follow my path through the mid game of a single game that I played yesterday where I was playing cybernetics. But you wouldn't really know what I was playing based on what I had right now. My strongest board, I felt, was me leveling up to level 6, following uh, on, on round 3-2, and playing a board with two brawlers, four cybernetics, and two vanguards. I've got a very strong front line. I have an ionic spark on my Vi. I've got a pretty decent Lucian at this point. I feel like this is my strongest board overall. When it comes to the mid game, you're going to be picking up and seeing a lot of four costs. A lot of people tend to ignore those four costs and, and kind of not use them uh, because they're not the four costs that they want for their, their final composition. I would recommend that you don't overlook the strength of certain four costs as a one off unit in your composition. Wukong is incredible CC. Cho'Gath is incredible CC, especially if you're combining it with a Vanguard or a Brawler. They're going to become a decent fr tanky frontline that offers a lot of um, additional power to your composition. 
Cassadin, especially at level two, is super good. Celestial and also disarms. So we're gonna we're gonna skip forward to about the midway st stage four, and you can see I have actually now transitioned into my Irelia at this point because I've added the blaster bonus with my Lucian with red buff. I actually think that uh, the Cho'Gath was stronger than the Irelia at this point, but I was basically testing as to whether the Irelia was good enough with a single BF sword to be to be good damage output. Um, and I managed to keep my, my my HP healthy enough all the way to stage five, where you can see that I'm playing a bit of a funky board. Uh, I'm playing a two-star Thresh at this point in time, uh, and a two-star Thresh for me is a really, really strong unit. So I'm adding in my two-star Thresh. Um, I'm putting on loads of good units on the bench, and then my Aurelia is also two-star now with the Deathblade and a... Um, a Last Whisper, which I think makes her pretty strong. And you can see that my Thresh actually helped me win this round by pulling in extra units. So this is what I consider my strongest board at this stage of the game. Um, I've got the... Um the, the Valkyrie bonus with the Misfortune on there. I've got five Cybernetics. I've got three Blade Masters. I've got two Blasters to make sure that Red Buff and my Lucian is working. This this is obviously not six Cybernetics, but I still feel like I'm playing my strongest board at this point in time. And I feel like it's good enough for me to start winning uh, a, a lot of these rounds. And you can see I'm actually running with a two cost Wukong as well. I end up uh, beating a very, very strong Kale player because I just feel like this is my strongest board at this point in time. Um, I'm combining a Soraka, by the way, because Soraka is an excellent unit for Thresh to pull onto the board. So now we're at round 6-4. I'm down, to, I'm down to 27 HP because I haven't yet found the Echo. But you can see what I've actually picked up right now. What I've picked up from round 6-4 Carousel is the Echo, finally. I've picked up a unit that allows me to complete my cybernetics. Um... I decide to place him on over the Gangplank, because Gangplank can be pulled on by Thresh, and he makes he becomes uh, pretty powerful. Um, and actually, now we're going to skip forward a little bit further when I'm at level 9, and I decide to actually kill off the Blaster bonus to add the two-star Gangplank straight up, as well as then having the Soraka, the, Lu the Lulu, and the Misfortune on my bench to be pulled in by the Thresh. This is not a conventional, conventional cybernetics board, but it is just what I feel like my strongest composition is. I just feel like the two-star Gangplank, he's a really, really good unit. Combine that with the rest of my cybernetics, I feel like this is just good enough for me to um, get wins at this stage of the game where I'm fighting for a top 3 or a top 1. Uh, and as you can see, we're actually beating out the the very, very, very strong Kale player at this point in time because this is what we chose to do with our board, and it's working out well for us. We actually ended up coming second that game due to a positioning error at the end, but irrespective, playing our strongest board got us a very comfortable top two with a composition that is really hard to pilot. So that is just an example of playing your strongest board. And my advice is, don't immediately place a unit on the field that is there to be in your final composition. It is okay to keep those units on your bench until they slot in and your composition is strong enough to utilize them. A lot of the mistakes that I made in the mid game that allowed me to yo-yo so heavily in diamond was that I would constantly find a unit that was there for my composition and I would just put it on the board and sell something else that I didn't need for economy. And that would sacrifice the strength of my board by doing so. That was a major issue for me uh, and was one of, the, one of the biggest reasons that held me back from Masters. And a lot of it comes with experience. I can't tell you what your strongest board is going to be every single game. There are certain boards that you can aim for, for sure, but ultimately, you want to build off what you've built in your early game. If you've got a Vanguard frontline, aim for four Vanguards frontline. If you've got a, a, a Brawler frontline, aim to mix up with two Brawlers, two Vanguards. If you've got Cybernetics, keep them in there and mix them with uh, two Vanguards or two Brawlers or whatever. You've got lots of options when it comes to playing the mid game. So just play your strongest board. It comes with experience, but it is a really, really, really important way to uh, preserve HP going into the later stages of the game. Okay, now we're going to look at another example where I was actually loose streaking going into the, the third stage and I was weak in terms of my actual board state. In this example, uh, I'm going to talk about how I stabilize from this position. Now, when I'm in this spot, there are two different ways or two different strategies that I look to employ. Either I'm going to play a uh, hyper roll build and I'm just going to go all in on, on one of the hyper roll builds that I was planning for. Now my my items didn't exactly allow for that so I didn't choose to go for the hyper roll strategy. Or you play for a level 6 slow roll strategy because you're going to have to start rolling at level 6 to get your board stronger otherwise you're just not going to make it. Now there are a few strategies that work well as a level 6 uh, um, hyper roll strategy 
the best of which is Mech and Space Pirate. Mech is still good, don't get me wrong. Mech, Mech got nerfed, but with the right items, Mech is still incredibly strong. Now, if I had the items for Space Pirates, um, or rather Space Jam, I would have done it. Um, but I had the items for Mech. My, my items suited Kaisa and Mech a little bit better. So in this example, I'm going to talk to you about what I did to stabilize in this game where it looked like I was in a bit of a shit situation because my board was pretty weak. So what I'm aiming to do is just field a board that can help prevent HP loss whilst hoarding units on my bench that are going to be useful to me. So right now, um, you can see that I'm playing essentially two vanguards, a random Malphite, and a um, and I'm going to randomly add a Kassadin in as well. So I'm just putting in units that I think are good that will help me kill at least one or two units every round. I'm not expecting to win rounds with this board. What I'm aiming to do is save up so that I can get to level six, and then I can start rolling for units that actually matter. So we're going to join me back here, which is now round three, six. What I've ended up doing is fielding four vanguards plus two infiltrators so i'm playing a four vanguard frontline plus two infiltrators now i'm not expecting to win but what i am expecting is to do slightly better than previously and you can see that the items that i've got we got we basically i think we got a full spatula carousel so the items that i've got are now building up towards something that i could really use in mech and after the next neutral round, we can start to really hammer home our mech play. Uh, and you can see here that, you know, versus this chap who's got the jinx, I'm not expecting to win. But if I kill like one or two units, that's better than outright losing and losing more HP. So you can see that we end up getting like one or two kills here, which is which is really good for me overall because it just reduces the amount of damage that I'm taking on a round by round basis. Now we're going to skip over to the neutral round a little bit further forward in the story uh, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, what i did here so i used that four vanguards until i found the fizz as soon as you find the fizz you put on your mechs mech is stronger than whatever board i was fielding beforehand and it does better with the items that i have as well i can then transition into um i can then transition into four infiltrators with the shako that i've got as well now a little bit extra to this game i was actually being contested for mech um and that essentially meant that I had to roll down uh, all of my gold earlier than I would have liked to do. Uh, I know that doesn't always sound like super great, but um, I kind of had to make that play just simply because uh, there was another guy contesting me. And I needed to t take that chance and just go for the units. And you'll see me do it in just a moment. But essentially, I decided that because I was being contested so heavily, it was better for me to go for the full roll down. Uh, and you can see here, this guy is at six. He's got a couple of units that I want. He's decided to commit to the mech play. So I said to myself, probably good at this stage in the game to actually take the risk and start rolling down. But you can see with the demo spat especially... Um, I think you need demo spat on Morellos as an absolute minimum to make this build work, but we are starting to win and do better in these uh, in these fights than I was previously. So I've managed to stabilize my board with a, sl a, a level six slow roll build, uh, which has come online very quickly, which is what Mech is good at doing. Mech, Mech is a build that I default to when I'm in a really bad situation and I just want to get out of it quickly with a board that just comes online super strong, uh, super uh, super readily. Now, I obviously skipped over a couple of Shackos here, unfortunately, because I'm an idiot, but I decided to just make the full roll down in this situation because I was up against a guy who was competing heavily for the same units as me and I wanted to make sure that um, I essentially at least secured the Kaiser and the Annie which was two of the the, the, the sort of the best units to, to pick up in this situation I'm doing it a little bit slowly because I'm not particularly um, good at hyper rolling um, but you can see rolling down I managed to get the three star Kaiser and as soon as I found the three star Kaiser I said to myself that's good enough like now we can now we can wait and roll down again uh, and we can probably force this other mech player out of the game just by having the three star Kaiser so that's the that's the play that I made in this situation. And it allowed me, as you can see here, to get to the point where we are second. Now, I'm up against a guy with just an incredibly ridiculous, like, insane composition. No way that I'm beating this guy in hell. But I got second from what was coming into stage three, a terribly, terribly awful situation. Like, I was just never going to win in most situations from that point onwards. But we played a composition that got online at level six really quickly and allowed me to stabilize the board, which was another adaptation that I made uh, off the back of uh, coming into the mid game okay let's talk about leveling in the mid game we kind of covered the early game but i'll just reiterate we talked about going to level four around two one or two two if you feel like you've got a win streak board if you don't feel like you've got a win streak board you can either pre-level on round two three to hit five after the carousel round or level to five on round two four after 
the uh, carousel round or take two five after the carousel round has completed okay so that's the way i would approach um leveling in the early game or you don't level at all if you're looking to hyper roll into a hyper roll composition like the shredder or the candyland comps and you do that either at the krug rounds if you're being competed for or you start pre-leveling or pre-rolling at the Krug rounds, or you'd roll at round three, one, which is the last round that you're level four. There is another strategy that has opened up, which is if you are in a good spot and you've got a great economy, slow rolling at level five to find your units, which I've seen a lot of high-level players do, and this protects your economy too. So you can also consider that. Uh, I just haven't put it in the guide because it will be a little bit too difficult to explain in this graphic. Um, I'm sorry for my handwriting, by the way. This is just some annotation that might help you understand. The other leveling strategies that you have in the mid game are if you are um, not hyper rolling, because if you're hyper rolling, what you would do from this point forward is you hit your your relevant three stars, uh, and then you just get to fifty gold and then level from there, right? Um, and then you just do it based on how strong you are and, and whatever board you get, right? But if you are not going to do, I'm going to get rid of that just because it's confusing the rest of the strategy, but. If you're just doing a normal leveling strategy, so let's say you got to five um, on the round after the carousel round, then you go to level six, either at, if you're win streaking, you can go to level six at three, one or three, two, depending on how strong you are. Um, if you're really, really strong, going to, 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 to level six on three, one might help you net your win streak and keep it going throughout round three. But I would do this with an air of caution. Because the hyper roll builds come online, at this stage of the game. So between rounds 3, 1 and 3, 2, the hyper roll builds are going to start to come online, okay? This is where, no matter how strong you were in stage 2 or round 2, you could just get trumped by hyper roll builds. So if you, let's say you are at 30 gold or 40 gold at round 3, 2, you roll to get to level 6 and you put your board in and you think you're strong, you lose to a hyper roll build here, your economy is in the drain and that can be really hard to come back from. So I would very much recommend treating uh, leveling to 6 early with an air of caution because the hyper roll meta exists. If the hyper roll meta didn't exist, it would be much safer to do this. In most cases, it's safer to go to 50 gold and then level to 6 plus using the excess interest aiming for level seven at round four one and if you're in a, if you're in a situation where you would benefit from a level eight to get your composition online or you would you were in a situation when you need a legendary to keep yourself in the game going for a fast eight at round four three otherwise leveling as normal with the interest in going to eight at round five one and then just using the level eight to either then go to level nine or roll you can all in at level nine uh, so you can all in at level eight looking for your legendary so some people roll down at this stage here they roll down to zero gold or, or 20 gold or 10 gold or whatever to find some certain units some people do it after their fast eight as well to try and find legendary units um, or you can just then go on to level nine and then just search for your legendaries at level nine Okay, this is a little bit confusing, I know. But the main thing that I want you to take away is that leveling in the mid game um, really should be looking to do mostly with your interest. You should mostly be looking to level with your interest unless you are looking to maintain a win streak and you are, think you can be stronger than the hyper roll compositions if they exist in your lobby. Because this is this is what's going to cause you to come undone if you in invest a lot of gold into getting to level six or even level seven, and then you end up losing to a hyper roll composition. You have to build your economy back from scratch, which can be very difficult to recover from. So leveling in the mid game um, essentially is a, a little bit more complex, where you should really be looking to assess the relative strength of the field, uh, assess when your composition needs to come online. If you're in a bad situation and you need to go to fast eight to find the units that you need to survive, then you can do that at around four three. Um, or you can fast date to look for uh, a legendary to try and take it off the board before anyone else gets it, for instance. Otherwise, you naturally go to level 8 at round 5-1, uh, and then either roll down or look to uh, to move on to level 9, depending on your HP. At this point in the game, your HP will be an indicator of, of whether level 9 is, is uh, accessible or not. If you're a high HP, 50, 50, 60 plus, you're probably able to get to level 9 without much sweat. If you are 30 or 40, you're probably looking to level down or roll down at level 8 and increase the strength of your composition overall throughout the mid game you should be looking to assess the relative strength of your composition um understanding whether you need certain two costs but also just again playing your strongest boards and that should be your your primary aim for the mid game now me saying playing your strongest board is not instantly going to teach you how to do that that it's something that honestly the best way that i can tell you to learn is by watching streamers and watching videos of high level players 
and understanding what they are playing and trying to uh, trying to figure out why ask yourself when you see a streamer play a board that you think looks weird why is he playing it which unit or or, or she which unit is she or he playing that is going to to make this board stronger at this current moment in time um, and for me i created myself a little tier list of units that i think can be added quite easily into compositions to make them stronger so we're going to go through them over the last few minutes of this video and talk through why i've chosen them kale she's super good by herself in the mid game fights tend to go long it's quite easy to activate at least two chrono in the mid game as well and that makes kale stronger plus she's quite good at holding items or just becoming your main carry kale can actually just take items in the mid game and you can transition into a kale carry composition and she's a good standalone unit so she's one of the best carry units to have because she's just good by herself and you can slot her into most compositions and, and add the valkyrie bonus as well pretty easily with the kaisa Wukong because he's Vanguard and Chrono. Both two Chrono and two Vanguard are so easy to splash and very strong. And Wukong's CC is very good too. He's a good Morello holder also. Uh, he takes a lot of good defensive items too. Uh, Wukong is just a really, really good uh, four cost unit to add to your composition. He's just very strong. Cho'Gath, a little bit like Wukong, but the brawler, bo the two brawler bonus is a little bit less strong, especially in the mid game when damage starts to ramp up. But his CC is very good. Jinx, because uh, you can add two blasters pretty easily. She's a good red buff distributor. You can run her with a red buff Ezreal or Ed red buff Lucian, and she can pop off with just two kills. So Jinx, I think, is a very good four cost. Jin, because sniper bonus is easy to activate, um, and you can work off a two-star Caitlyn as your sniper count, uh, your sniper carry counterpart. Soraka, because her heal is underrated. Irelia is kind of mediocre in my opinion, but she is solid as an item holder. You can give her items that you would either use for Irelia carry, or give her items that you might transfer over to Jinx or over to Kale. She's like pretty good in that respect, and she's a good blade master. So having her as a blade master trait and mana reaver, which you have a, if you have a Cassidy on the board or you're playing Space Jam and you have a Darius, adding in mana reaver is super strong as you get towards mid game. And Velkoz, he's pretty solid. Um, he really does require sorcerer or void to work well um i don't think he's the best splash in the unit and then a, a fizz really only works if you're playing mech or you're adding him as an infiltrator splash in a two infiltrator build then it comes to legendary units or five costs misfortune and lulu are really good like they're both great individual splash units misfortune does a crap ton of damage lulu's got great cc and plus lulu provides you with both celestial and mystic which is just two very very useful two cost uh, or two splash synergies gangplank great individual unit his damage is strong demo bonus is easy to activate he's got great upgrades he can be slotted in any composition as an individual carry even then just adding in a rumble or a ziggs to add the demo bonus too he's just a good splash unit thresh the same thing he's chrono he's mana reaver um just incredibly good unit to have on board. Zerath, not so good. Um, honestly, with outside of Darkstar or with outside of Chrono, he, he attacks too slow to be useful. Echo, um, good in Infiltrator, good in Cybernetics, but as an individual splash unit, not particularly great. And Aurelian Soul is arguably the worst uh, uh, five cost to have on the board. He needs Rebels to really be good. Um, as an individual unit, he's much worse than Singed was, for instance, in set two. So that's my, my take on Aurelian Soul. Towards the end of the mid game, you're going to be looking to transition into your late game build, and that is usually defined by your items. Um, I feel like most of you should have an idea about what items are good for what particular, for which particular builds. Um, so I'm not going to include a massive um, kind of talk about which items are good. There are uh, good websites out there. I'll link one in the description that can help you focus your builds based on the items that you find throughout the game. But again, really, you should be focusing your build in on the items that you have towards the mid game. Uh, and you can then transition out of your, str your strong boards. And a lot of it comes with experience about finding out when your particular build comes online, be it a certain level with certain traits. Do you need to get a two cost Kale? Do you need to get a two, a two star Jinx even? Um, so a lot of that's going to come with experience. But hopefully, you've learned something across the, the course of this video. And I'm sorry it's been so long i just felt like there was a lot to talk about um but it's definitely my the way i've changed my mindset and the way i play is very different now now that i've uh, i've kind of changed the way I've, I've kind of approached the game it's helped me improve and place top four more consistently over the course of the last few days which has allowed me to very consistently go from diamond two to master after having yo-yoing between the two of them over and over again so the real test for me now is going to be whether i can make it to grandmaster which i hope i can i hope this has been interesting and i hope i'll see you guys soon